Well, I think we can start. Um, hi, my name is Paulina Grodzicka. I'm a co-organizer of Product Tank Warsaw uh, in Poland. And uh, I'm very, very happy and also very, very stressed out about this first uh, online um, experiment that uh, we're introducing to our community. I would like to welcome very much all um, Warsaw community members, but also uh, a very, very large audience from Krakow. Uh, so thank you very much for, for being here today. Uh, enjoy, have a drink. I'm going to have a drink in a few minutes <laughs> and uh, let's let's start. Uh, so what is Product Tank to, to all of you who don't know? Um, it's, it's a meetup that has been created 10 years ago. Uh, it's currently uh, in, over, in over 200 cities. Um, it's um, products, it's um, designed for, uh, for product people and uh, made by product people. Uh, we just wanted to, to meet, learn uh, from others, and uh, it's no longer such a lonely job uh, as we have each other. So how does this work? Um, it's informal, friendly event with two, three speakers to get the conversation started, uh, and then networking over drinks to, to discuss. Uh, in Poland, uh, we're not only in, in Warsaw, but also in Krakow, Poznan, Gdańsk, and Wrocław. Uh, so if you are from any of those cities, uh, sign up to, to the meetup.com com, um, uh, meetup in, in your city. You can follow us on Facebook. Uh, we've all decided to, uh, in Poland to, to be uh, on a, you, you, to use uh, one uh, Product Tank Poland page. Uh, so you can find out uh, about all events happening in Poland in one place. You can also join uh, product talks uh, from product people from around the world um, and uh, visit uh, the, the biggest product blog, uh, mindtheproduct.com. Subscribe to the newsletter. Uh, it's a weekly one, very good one. Uh, I highly recommend it. And uh, as always, if you have any questions, ideas, let us know. We're here for you. Um, so only that we can, uh, we can improve. Today's topic uh, is the product discovery. And um, I would like to add now all of our speakers. Hi. Hey, everyone. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Hi. Uh, so um, first off, uh, we're going to start with, with Rec. Uh, Rec will be uh, explaining to, to us the more of a theory um, on um, the best practices uh, for product uh, discovery um, at any scale. Um, and uh, then we're going to dive uh, into more uh, details from, from uh, Mike. Uh, Mike is going to um, go through a few tips on how to run the first product discovery. Um, and we'll finish off with uh, Jana, uh, who will be going through the product uh, market fit and I would like to thank you very, very much uh, to all the speakers for joining us today. Um, I'm super, super excited uh, about those uh, presentations. So uh, without any further ado, um, I will give my voice to, to, Greg, to Greg. Hi, everyone. Very nice to be here. Uh, I am going to try to share my desktop here, and hopefully you will see that. If uh, one of the other speakers could tell me to make sure that uh, my stuff is up, I would appreciate it. So we are going to talk, as uh, Paulina said, about product discovery. I've been doing product management for a long time, mainly in really big software companies. I've also worked for some smaller companies and have had my own consulting and training practice for four or five years. Just founded a PM career service called career.pm. And most of my consulting is with global B2B companies, usually pretty big ones. Let's start with a definition. Uh, the word product discovery or discovery, the concept is starting to get overloaded. But traditionally, it's meant uh, finding a new product. I tweak that definition a little bit to refer to, uh, you know, de-risking any big investment that I want to make in a product incremental investment. So if I want to spend money that I didn't already have allocated to something, 
that can be risky. I want to de-risk that and product discovery is a great way to do that. Uh, it is not just normal requirements management or input management as I tend to call it. You get input from a lot of your stakeholders. You've got to filter that, prioritize it, do all that stuff. This is something different. It's not like just a session you have over a couple of days. I mean, you can have a product discovery session, but that's not end-to-end uh, -end product discovery. It's not just some UX-led activity. I have to design the entire product. I have to think about the problems I'm going to solve. So it goes far beyond end users. Um, and we're not trying to come up with a really detailed solution uh, in discovery. We're trying to convince ourselves that developing this thing and taking it to market is a good idea based on what we define as success. Some truths, it's really hard a lot of the times. It can be very fun but challenging, especially in the complex problem space, and it's unpredictable. You can invest months and months of effort and determine that it's just not viable. It's just not something you should do. That can be uh, kind of depressing, but it's much better than building something, taking it to market and figuring that out. You need to do it. You should go through these kind of activities that I'm going to talk about if you are taking on a big investment. And very few companies have a mature product discovery process. They stumble into it. They make decisions for a host of reasons, many of which have little to do with uh, kind of you know, market fit. Why do we do it? This is what you should have on your mind. We want to de-risk this big investment. How can we approach it in a way that if it's not a good idea, we discover that very early? and that we make a conscious business decision to develop something. It's amazing how much money gets spent uh, on products that never really went through a formal process or went through a formal process that was really flawed. What are the risks we're talking about that the market just won't care about the product, uh, that we're focusing on our customers instead of the rest of the market? That's a mistake a lot of companies make, especially mature companies. And you hear people talk all the time, customer this, customer that. Customers are important. But if you want to grow, you also have to think about the rest of the market. Uh, sometimes we just don't you know, solve a critical mass of the problem and we fail. So I will show you some steps, a way to think about this top down uh, that can help you de-risk this type of activity. What triggers it? When do I do product discovery? It can just be a new opportunity I see in the market. Opportunities usually come from problems people have. Sometimes they just want to be delighted. but especially in B2B where I come from, companies pay to have their problem solved. Maybe some big new technology, 5G or something, could just be a wild idea that you have. Uh, some of the best ideas I have, quite frankly, when I'm like participating in these types of events, they have to do with product management. I'm not thinking just about my work and I find it inspiring. That can give you an idea that you need to think about deeply before you try to develop. So how should we do product discovery? Well, this is one way to think about it, is that you're going to have input all the time from the market, from your stakeholders, from the team that you're on. This is just input. You've got to look at it. You've got to filter it based on what you are trying to accomplish. That's something I call business motivation. What are your goals and objectives? You have to test if there is sufficient pull from the market and other important stakeholders. And things that make it through this funnel can go into this kind of formal discovery process. When I say formal, that doesn't mean that you know, it has to take a bunch of time and is like this really rigorous process. It means I decide, okay, I'm going to, I take this seriously enough to do product discovery. I'm going to dedicate some effort to it. And we describe it through something called a practice. Uh, this isn't a best practice necessarily. A practice is just a description of a complex knowledge worker-based process and helps you get your head around it. I've worked with a lot of product managers, a lot of organizations. Most PMs are very smart. They don't want to be told exactly what to do, but they also don't want to start from just a blank slate. They want some guidance. And we have come up with a representation, I think, that gives uh, PMs uh, that guidance. It is not like some rigid methodology. You should not look at this as waterfall. I'm going to show you a very simplified model that could be misinterpreted that way. That's not the goal. The goal is to simplify something that can be super complex, I've been involved in product discovery that lasted, you know, the better part of a year. Uh, it can be faster than that, depending on the problem space you're addressing. Uh, this is not something that I would do for just kind of normal evolution of the product. Once again, this is about really going in a new direction and trying to de-risk that decision. 
So if we look at it at the highest level as a black box, something triggers uh, my interest in you know taking something to market. I need to understand the business motivation of the organization. How do we define success? What are we trying to achieve? I have to think about what's consistent with the brand. And a lot of interesting things come out of this process. And what comes out depends on kind of what you're doing. The things you would expect is some deep analysis into the problem, some analysis into the stakeholders of that problem, a description of the business model, a business justification, and eventually what I'm driving toward is an investment decision. I want a bunch of people who are accountable for the business to come together and say, yes, this is something we should do. And again, organizations fall into developing products all the time. And I think that's one of the reasons we see so many products fail. So the simplified model takes this really complex process and breaks it down into a few phases to provide guidance. Uh, so I start with planning. I do some problem analysis. Before I think about the solution, we'll talk about some of these in a little bit of detail. I look at multiple solutions, ideally, and then pick the one that's best. I try to find a business model or propose a business model that I think is viable. I then need to justify that we should make this investment most of the time. There are some times when things are very clear. A competitor comes out with a new killer feature, you're getting killed in the market and you need to respond. I wouldn't use this process for that kind of thing. Sometimes you just need to kind of go. Some of the things you can do, you know, good hygiene, do problem analysis, think about the solution. But sometimes you know you just need to go. This is more when you have an opportunity that you're just not sure uh, if you can be successful in and you want to make a rational decision. So uh, by the way, at the end, we do a retrospective. We're always trying to improve. So let's dissect a couple of these. Uh, this is a, an abbreviated version of how we describe the phases. Each phase has a set of goals. What are we trying to achieve? And in planning, uh, I want to form the team. I want to identify stakeholders and get them on board. And this is nothing more than just thinking before doing, something we all need to probably do more. Uh, this is probably 5 to 10% of the total effort. Uh, what are the key things that you're doing? You're creating a lean plan. I'll show you one of those. We define what's out of scope. That can be very beneficial to the team, help us avoid needless conversations. Uh, we try to get commitment from people to support us as we do this. What are the tools that we use? Uh, very early on, I like to use a lean canvas, even though capturing the business model comes later. Every idea I have, I start with a lean canvas. And if I can't create a lean canvas that excites me, excites others, then I know I need to go back to the drawing board or move on, go to another idea. And for each phase, we define exit guidance. Kind of like, hey, once you've done this, you can feel pretty good about moving on to the next phase. That doesn't mean you can't start activities in the next phase whenever you want. But there's always kind of a center of gravity if you want to kind of track this thing. At a certain point, you start planning less and start problem analysis more. And you could think of yourself in that you know, sense as uh, in the, for example, pro uh, problem analysis phase. So a great way to look at this is through a lean plan. This is a template. I think for almost everything you do, you should develop an elevator pitch. Just a few sentences that describe it. Uh, this is based on a use case that uh, we want to protect cities against malicious drones. This comes from my past. This is something that I worked on. And you should be able to summarize it in just a few sentences. This is a lot of work. This is really hard, but super valuable. Help to get it clear, you know, get it clear in your mind and in the mind of stakeholders, helps you explain the leadership. In this lean plan, I would talk about what you expect to come out of this thing. That's important to get the you know, kind of commitments from the team. I would talk about what are the key risks. This isn't to your solution. This is what are the key risks in terms of product discovery. I've been doing product discovery and it was the end of the fiscal year and we were not allowed to talk to salespeople. That is almost a death sentence. But that was one of the risks we had, that we couldn't get the amount of validation we thought we needed from sales. In this case, what is triggering this thing? We're looking at the market trends. There have been a bunch of high you know, profile incidents. And now we know that terrorist organizations are actively looking into drones. And you know, last year, there was a huge attack on Saudi Arabia from what people would be labeled as terrorists. And it was, uh, you know, they used drones. I would define the goals of product discovery. What do we expect to come out of this? And they should be real, realistic. We don't expect a fully fledged solution to come out of this, but uh, we want to look 
for example, in this case, we want to find non-kinetic security options. We want to find ways to through radio waves and stuff that we can defend ourselves. This is based on the OMG business motivation model. So I have goals and a set of objectives. If I shoot this map very cleanly to OKRs, if you prefer those. Uh, here, I map the motivation of the discovery effort to what I'm trying to achieve in the organization to show that if this is successful, I will actually be moving the organization forward. So if the organization is wanting to increase product-based revenue, I can say, hey, most of the revenue from what we're going to build will come from product licensing. Just an example. I always like to pick some things and say, look, these are out of scope. We're just not going to talk about them as part of this effort. Can uh, save a lot of needless conversation. Why are we, do we have a schedule? What is driving the schedule? What are some constraints that we have in my you know, uh, history, always working for these big vendors, it was almost big trade events. You had really one time a year, maybe twice a year, that you could do a really big launch. So you needed to be at critical mass, you know, whatever that means uh, by the time you go to Sapphire, by the time you go to, you know, DevCon or whatever it is. Um, I like to set up some milestones. I don't think you should, you know, we don't want to throw Agile out the window. But if there are schedule drivers, you want to identify more or less, this is what we're planning to do. And of course, as you go, you're going to adjust as you learn. Who are the stakeholders in this? What is their contribution? What do you expect of them? Very early on, you should talk to them and get their commitment. Here, sometimes you see that you don't have people and that's a red flag or something to look into. Here, we don't have like a product marketing person allocated to this effort and that's an issue. They need to give us kind of the market perspective. They need to be on board from the beginning. And very often you've already done some stuff. I would capture that, you know, this didn't start yesterday. We've already pitched this to executive leadership. They're on board. Uh, and then talk about what the next steps are. And that's kind of a lean plan. Very easy to put together. You can whip one of these together in 15 minutes, maybe for more elaborate things. It'll take a few days, maybe a week. Uh, but what you will find in product discovery is that you keep onboarding people. These things, you know, it takes a direction you can't foresee and you need to involve another salesperson or you find out that you really need a different UX person or finance needs to come on board. Very nice to have a very crisp plan to show them 20 slides they can go through and figure out what you're trying to do. So this is important. The next phase, once we've done our planning and we're happy, we think stakeholders understand what we expect, we keep ourselves in the problem domain. We don't think about the solution. We want to understand the problem very deeply. And this is something that most organizations skip to their detriment. There are insights you get from thinking about the problem that you will never get in the solution. So super important to do this. There are some tools that you can use. We have one called a problem profile. It's kind of like, you know, goes beyond just a problem statement. Jobs to be done, as far as I'm concerned, is a problem solving methodology. There's a lot to be learned there. And you know that you're ready to get out of problem analysis once you validated the problem. So this is something that I see skipped all the time. You read in the literature, people jump to doing prototypes and all that stuff. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Before you do that, go back to the stakeholders and make sure you really understand their problem. Just like you never get the solution right the first time, you do not understand their problems the first time. You have to play them back and refine your understanding. So in the case of this solution, this is something we might show for the problem space, that around the world, all kinds of crazy things are happening with drones. Uh, there are other scenarios that share the same kind of problem. Uh, you may not know it, but now drone vandalism is a thing. And I guess it could be a lot more malicious than just paint. Uh, I like to show uh, what the challenges are or problems by what I call customer stakeholder in B2B, the Customer is actually an aggregate. It's a bunch of people. And you need to pick out the ones that are most important, like the economic buyer, the people who are going to actually be using it, and figure out what their problems are, because their problems are different. And you probably have to solve a critical mass of each stakeholder's problem. And sometimes their problems are contradictory. The solution, it's impossible to make both of them happy. So you really have to understand them and you know, who's important. Here is an example of a problem profile. I don't want to go into this. We don't have time. But you do capture a problem statement. You then think about stakeholders and their pain. And that very often identifies people you hadn't thought of before. 
you want to capture supporting facts so you can really demonstrate that there's a problem. You do root cause analysis to try to figure out, you know, what is really the cause of this thing. And this is important, something very few people do. You define the desired state. How do I know when this problem is solved? And most non-trivial solutions will actually solve a bunch of problems. So you will have several of these. And you can take this artifact, you can clean it up a little bit, you can go back to stakeholders and say, hey, I think as a city leader, one of your biggest problems is loss of life and property. Am I right? Yes, yeah, so, well, I mean, that's only one answer to that question. But to some of the others, ones, just like you do with features, you want to start with the problems and you want to prioritize them. So I think we'll make these slides available and you can digest this. Very simple tool, very powerful. So what we've identified, the key problem areas or themes that we want to look into, we want to be able to detect malicious drones, we want to be able to defend against them, and we want to have a response in case something happens. Uh, once we feel like we have a handle on the problem and we validate it, we move on to exploring solutions. We could just as easily call this solutions exploration. Same thing, you can look at this. There are a lot of tools and activities that we do here. We start sketching personas. At this stage, we may do some proofs of concept. Ideally, we look at multiple solutions and based on you know objective criteria, we pick the best one. And by the way, things like profitability and so forth are important uh, criteria there. And once I have a nice solution description uh, and I understand the solution, I'm ready to move on to the next phase. Uh, I always, by the way, when I pitch these things, include a architecture. Uh, it's hard to just understand these things in the abstract. And here, very simple, we show there's a command and control center with some capabilities. We do fleet management and then in the operational environment, we've got radar, we've got cameras, we've got mobile jammers, all this kind of stuff. Picture, you know, a thousand words or, yeah. Uh, and this is also an opportunity, I think, to show people graphically uh, how this thing operates. This is, you know, today with like startups, lean, agile, all this stuff, we don't invest in this enough. But if you do this right, you really can, you know, influence people, I think, much better. Uh, here we have a public event, it's an outside concert, and lo and behold, we have this uh, crazy drone that shows up. Nobody knows what it is. It may be malicious, maybe somebody just wants to see the concert. So we use a special command to basically hijack the drone and send it back to its origin. Most commercial drones, uh, you can do that. We send it back, then we use a number of sensors to triangulate to find out where the pilot is. We dispatch uh, public safety officers to go get those people. And there we've shown kind of a canonical scenario. So here is what the solution will address per theme. We break it down. These are the things that we're gonna do. I think this is highly digestible. You might have backup slides that go into more detail. And then before we show the challenges and problems for the key customer stakeholders, here we show the value prop, what we promise them. And notice that, you know, this is a B2B app. It's not just about facts, figures, specs. What we give safety operators is peace of mind. What we give public, public safety leadership, one of the most compelling things we can give them is just peace of mind that they have done everything they can to protect their citizens against, you know, this kind of thing. Once we know what solution or solutions we're leaning to, we can start thinking about a business model. A business model doesn't make sense unless you have some idea of a solution. I'm a big lean canvas guy. Other people use the business model canvas. And I've seen a lot of companies that create their own version. Uh, go with what you like. I like the lean canvas because it focuses on the problem. It talks about the solution. So when you're done, you actually know what they're talking about. I like the idea of a unique value proposition. We don't have time to go through this. But this captures important parts of the business model on one page and is great for aligning the team early on and aligning stakeholders. Uh, once we feel like we have a viable business model, uh, people agree, we can move on to the business justification. And this usually involves creating a business case in a mature organization. It doesn't have to be you know, a full business case. I have my own suspicions about those. But you should document the problems you're going to solve, what you want to build, what the, you know, economic impact you expect is, what the costs are, and that should drive a decision about whether we do this or not. And too often we kind of skip this or we use numbers that are just ridiculous. And I've seen huge multi-million dollar bets made on, well, it's a market of X size. If we can get 10% of that, we'll be, you know, we'll do great. 
doesn't usually work out that well. Uh, you know, here you want to create some form of uh, business case. And by the way, uh, Canvas is not a business case. It captures part of the business model. It's supposed to be concise. It doesn't say anything about risk. It doesn't say anything about competitors. It doesn't have any quantification whatsoever, you know, necessarily. So we should not confuse these things. Capture your business model, make sure you think it's viable and you're still gonna have to do some analysis to think, you know, is this thing gonna generate the business benefit that I expect? That may be adoption, maybe profitability. And yeah, we have these big dreaded spreadsheets. But in a large organization, a lot of people are vying for the money and you have to show that you can, yeah, generate the business results that leadership expects. Not a lot to say about the retrospective. Uh, what we really want to do is archive things in a place that we can get back to them. We want to see what went well, what didn't go well. We want to talk to all the stakeholders. Uh, and we want to do it better, more effectively, more efficient the next time. So I have shown you this sequential set of phases. I've shown you a summary of what you do in those phases. Don't take this as like some waterfall prescriptive thing. This is some guidance for you. And it helps to think about the rationale behind the steps. So with planning, we want you to think before you act. We want you to understand the problem before you rush off and try to create a solution. We wanna make sure that we have a solid business model before we do a lot of financial projections because that can be very expensive. We want to make sure that we're making business decisions, fair business decisions based on solid analysis. And of course, we as an organization want to continuously improve, and that is reflected in the phases that I showed you. So product discovery is this process, and it can be really hairy, involving tens of people or more. It can take months and months. I assume in some cases it takes years. I've worked on super complex uh, solutions for my clients. Uh, mission critical communications, emissions testing, big things, and product discovery can easily take six or eight months. Uh, think about using a practice so that you don't skip steps so that you can explain what you're doing to other people and adapt it over time to your organization, to your needs. And every effort is different. So that's what you get paid for. You're a knowledge worker. You're supposed to use your knowledge, hopefully wisdom, to approach this in the best way. Look at the practice. It's guidance. Use what's valuable. Discard what's not. And completely you know, or continuously sharpen the axe. Uh, yeah, uh, I launched this, uh, career service, career.pm. Take a look if you're interested in, you know, uh, taking your PM career to the next level. These are the kinds of things that we offer. Uh, this is also something we launched recently. It's, uh, called PM font. You can search for anything that has to do with product. Uh, we've got, you know, hundreds and hundreds of podcasts in this. We've got a bunch of blog uh, blogs index, a bunch of good articles. Uh, I was doing some work on a course the other day and I went back to it and typed in pricing and was, you know, really personally amazed at what great information I found. So most of the stuff in there is curated or it comes from blogs and podcasts that we just believe in. Uh, a few thousand resources and I think we're going on 4,000 resources. So take a look at that. Uh, you can join our community, get our newsletter. And uh, yeah, with that, uh, presentation is done. Thank you very much, Greg. Uh, it was great to, to hear your, your talk. Um, I have to say that I'm, I'm very thrilled we have you on board today. Uh, Greg has spent uh, the last 20 years helping some of the biggest uh, companies uh, in the world uh, deliver better products. Uh, so he has tons of experience and I'm sure that um, if anyone has any questions now, uh, it's now the best time to, to add them in the, in the comments. Um, so the only thing that I can see is the question, where can we find slides for this talk? <laughs> So, Greg, would you? Um, yeah, I'm happy to share them. Maybe you have some central way. If not, we'll we'll figure it out, right? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, are there any other questions from uh, from the audience? If not, uh, we can still uh, just we can move on uh, to the next speaker, and uh, we'll still have time at the end. 
uh, to to answer any of the questions. If you will have any questions to to Greg, uh, he will be staying with us until the end of the uh, the event. So thank you very much, Greg. Thanks, everybody. everybody. Some, uh, some comments, some talk. Thanks. <laughs> so thank you very much. And I will make some change. I will add Mike to the screen. Hi, Mike. Hi. Hi, everyone. Hi. Hello. Mike is uh, uh, one of us. <laughs> so he's, uh, he's Polish. Um, but for the sake of the event, we're just going to call him Mike. Uh, <laughs> yep. Let's do it. I will share my presentation. I, I hope you will see it in a in a second. So Mike, uh, um, for the last 10 years, he developed a few educational platforms and mobile apps. Uh, he also ran a few startups. Um, and he's also an instructor or a trainer at uh, Polish Product Management Academy, uh, where he t actually teaches about product discovery and innovation um, development. So. I'm, I'm very happy to have him on board as well. And I'm going to add your slides. One second. OK. OK. So, Just let me know if you see my uh, my slides correctly right now. I'm going to move myself. So thank you very yeah. much. And uh, show of hands. So Mike Reda. Uh, <laughs> OK, thanks a lot. Okay, guys, so uh, it's really great to be here with you. And uh, I'm here to speak a few words about tips, how to run your first product discovery effectively. Um, okay, so as you know, I'm Mike and I, I love building and scaling great products. This is what I do uh, for the last 10 years. And uh, I had an um, opportunity to work uh, as a product manager, as a head of user research team and also as a growth hacker or a marketer. And it was a great experience for me because I had, uh, um, this allowed me to, to learn a broad spectrum of strategies, frameworks, methods, and tools uh, to understand the ecosystem of the products or how to, how to build them and how to, how to grow them. Uh, and my goal hasn't changed for those, uh, for those uh, 10 years. So, um, oh, sorry, maybe, so. okay. I hope it's okay right now. Okay, so my my goal hasn't changed, and I'm I'm all the time motivated to 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 build great things for for people to to solve real problems. And what's my goal for today's presentation for you guys? And I want to provide you a few hands-on experiences, tips, and thoughts that will help you run your first valuable product discovery and avoid mistakes I've made in the past so you don't have to. Um, I will focus on uh, choosing challenges that new teams are facing uh, when starting to work on uh, new product development. Uh, my experience refers um, to uh, mostly to a dynamic startup and small and medium-sized businesses, but I hope you can also find some useful uh, tips if you develop and run product discovery for existing products uh, or work in the enterprise solution space, like uh, previous uh, Greg talk about, talked about, you know, his experiences that are really great with the B2B enterprise uh, environment. So I will also uh, share with you some, some basic thoughts because I believe that uh, we have to master basics if we want to go deeper. All right, so uh, my uh, product discovery approach changed over time because when I started to, to develop products and to work in digital area like 10 years ago, I was um, more like a one-man army and I was really um, intuition and opinion driven person so I had great ideas I hope so <laughs> and I, I was lucky because few of them uh, actually uh, did a good job and uh, I uh, I focused mainly on big and complex researches yeah so this was this was at the beginning now it's a little bit different because now I see uh, value uh, in product discovery when I do it uh, in, a, in a team. So a teamwork, this is for me a teamwork uh, action uh, done in a structured way 
with a great focus on quick learning and adjusting the plan when new uh, insights and data occur. So after those um, few uh, changes in my understanding and working on product discovery, I realized that I can learn faster, make fewer mistakes and have more fun doing it. Uh, and what uh, really matters, I believe I'm more efficient in truly uncovering problems worth solving and solutions worth building, of course. So uh, you may you may uh, you might see some of the definitions of product discovery. There are a lot of them. Uh, I would like to to share my definition of product discovery. Uh, basically, this is uh, product discovery is about building the right product uh, for the right audience in a way that brings unique value for that audience and for the business behind the product. Uh, I refer this, um, I refer this uh, to, uh, to new products. Uh, and uh, what is more, I think product discovery is a non-linear agile focused on people process that contains some exploration, learning, ideation, and validation phases of both problems and solutions. Uh, you can you can see also some other examples from uh, Teresa Torres or Tim Herbrick, for example. But I believe uh, essence of all of the product discovery uh, definition is that they all focus on getting actionable learnings, collecting evidence, and validating ideas directly on um, on um, real user behaviors. All in all, our ultimate goal is to build the right product for the right people. Um, all right, so uh, I'm really inspired by the lean startup approach. Uh, so when we talk about uh, when we talk about product discovery uh, with a new team with a, on new product, lean startup and lean UX uh, approach is is something that that we have to take into the consideration. Uh, of course, there's another uh, definition and another branch of uh, continuous uh, of, of product discovery. This is a continuous product discovery, and it's uh, made for the teams that are working on and developing existing products uh, th then we can talk about uh, um, uh, so-called dual track development uh, uh, and this is like more repeatable iterative way of working through discovery process but for today let's focus on new teams and new products that they want to build uh, why does it matter uh, why does it matter because uh, it's probably easier than ever to build a new product these days, yeah, right? But developing a great product that people will, will want to buy and use uh, as we designed is another story. As you can see, kids hacked a little bit design that someone made. Uh, so, well, this is how it works. And uh, as you know, no business want to invest its resources in a product that no one will buy. No teams want to build things that no one will want uh, and doesn't care about. So I believe you don't, as a product manager, you don't want to see this kind of view when building your next great solution, right? Uh, I experience uh, I, I, I experience it when building a startup once, and I can just tell you that it, this is a miserable feeling. Uh, but on the other hand, it learned me a lot. So please have it in mind uh, and try to really understand what people want and how we can help them. Uh, all right. So it's time for for some for some tips about uh, the product discovery uh, and how to how to start it. Okay. Everything starts with the culture. I believe the right uh, culture that allows you to and helps you to conduct product discovery efforts is a must have. Yeah, Without it, even if you conduct best class research and validation processes, capture great insights and data that support your ideas, uh, basically your boss can kill it because he decides uh, in a different way that is not aligned with you and your team. Uh, 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 and um, well, the, I find that companies try to, you know, make product discovery, uh, but they find some obstacles. And these obstacles are not tools and technology, but shared behaviors, beliefs, and, and values. OLX, as you can see here, um, CEO of OLX uh, and some, some quotes from a Drift team. Uh, we've got some other like um, cases like Bing, Facebook, Amazon, Airbnb. Uh, these are just few companies to mention that, that go this way and learn really fast uh, and, and great, do it great. Uh, there are a lot of, uh, you know, small and medium sized uh, companies, startups that encourage their teams to learn, experiment and look for the best uh, solutions uh, but 
this is the uh, one hand. On the other hand, we've got uh, for one really learning organization, I believe we've got like 10 or even 15 that don't follow those rules, yeah? So basically, uh, the culture that allows you to make a product discovery is about courage, data driven and curiosity. And it's about, you know, understanding that failure as an opportunity to learn and adapt. So uh, let's let's see at the beginning uh, and uh, let's check uh, what are the answers for those questions. It's, it's really important to ask yourself and your team, uh, your, your stakeholders, your chiefs, the, the, those kind of questions, yeah, about about the, how the decision-making process looks like. Is our organization embracing culture of learning fast and experiment, experimentation? Uh, can we can we fail? Can we can we fail? Is it is it okay for for us because we 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 believe that we and we can learn from it uh, and is it allowed for us uh, that we don't you know be kicked off of our 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 job if we fail? Yeah, um, um, and uh, if. Uh, it, it would be good to, to 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 check if those attitudes are rooted in our company's mission. Does everybody understand that? Yeah. So if we've got this freedom and trust, then uh, we are in, in the right place, in the right organization to start our product discovery. It's also about being a little bit fun, I I, I would say, because uh, being uh, as David Kelly says um, uh, said one, once, uh, being playful is uh, of huge importance of, for being innovative. So if you work with people that are some of the hackers, that are f guys who are looking for. Um, Great, uh, you know, problems that they can uh, you, they can they can find a solution. Uh, this is and they've got a fun doing it. This is the good place. This is a great place. So as long as you learn and have fun, and can you know broke some things to learn a little bit more. This is the culture you are you are looking for. I had this opportunity to work with a great team for two years, and we had a really great time working together. It was great experience, and and yeah, it was a lot of fun for us as well. Okay, so when we've got the culture fit, then the team is second. Uh, as Ed, Ed Catmull, founder of Pixar and author of uh, Creativity in my C book, uh, said once, uh, if you give a good idea to a medical team, they will screw it up, yeah? But if you give a medical idea to a brilliant team, they will either fix it or throw it away and come up with something better. This is a great essence of product discovery because uh, at the beginning, we start with, with, some, with some assumptions, but over the time, the assumptions that, that, that we are validating uh, make us uh, make us change what we what is our vision of the product of the solution and and how we should approach it. Yeah, so um, uh, a great team can change the way you work. Yeah, because you've got these productive discussions, you've got more collected data, relevant data. You've got different points of views, and this is really valuable one. Uh, uh, and this can be uh, even your unfair advantage in your company. And and I believe that the proper discovery team um, really. Um, puts high your chances uh, of success, a few times higher even, in, in my opinion. So you will work faster, you will decide in a more objective way, and you will overcome obstacles in more uh, in more sufficient way, yeah? And you won't be there, you know, uh, alone with your ego and with your assumptions and with your biases. That's, 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 uh, that's normal for if you conduct product discovery alone. Okay, so uh, just before uh, your team will start working on product discovery project, I highly recommend you to organize a short workshop so when you all can define your team's purpose, goals, rules, values, and responsibilities uh, that everyone will have. Uh, this will help you to better unify and align uh, with each other, uh, and uh, you will see further in the process how valuable it, it is. You can experience fewer misunderstandings, better uh, executions, and more successful results results as, as, as main outcomes, I would say. If you feel that it, it is needed, you can also invite your main stakeholders or sponsors for this workshop. You can use the team canvas, as you can see here on, on, on the screen. Uh, there is also a team alignment map, another canvas. Uh, pick one that best suits your context and needs, uh, but uh, I highly recommend you to do that. Okay, if you got the culture and a team set up, uh, uh, it, is, it is really important to make your plan A. As Greg 
early mentioned. Uh, it's really important to draft your plan A, and it should be done with the care uh, and based on the information you already have. So use, uh, for example, data from extensive desk research, if you did some market reports uh, from your organization uh, uh, or even from your own experience. I also find it val uh, valuable to validate plan A with uh, market experts, if this is, of course, possible for you. They have extensive knowledge and, for example, they can point you out some more even riskier assumptions that you would never think about. But then you have to do one thing, go and validate them as fast as possible. Um, and uh, and uh, as you can see, my uh, stack for plan A is empathy map, value proposition canvas, lean canvas, so the same as, as Greg's. Customer journey map is really important. And uh, at the end, uh, we are extracting from all of those artifacts uh, our riskiest assumptions and, and uh, organize it in the backlog. Um, so this is how how things works um, for me. And remember, those uh, those canvas are your living artifacts that you can you have to systematically improve and learn when you learn and validate new things. So this is important not to abandon them on the wall or put them into the, your shelf after the workshops. They should be a living artifacts that sums up your team's knowledge and progress and helps you moving forward. You can of course digitalize them if you work remotely. Uh, with the usage of uh, Mural or Miro software, for example, or if you work together in the office, create some kind of a war room or at least uh, uh, at least some kind of a space on the wall where you can draw and your plan in la large formats and refine them with the help of post-it notes, for example. Uh, okay. So there's a problem with the problem, I would say, yeah, because uh, as you know, we've got this double diamond uh, inspired from uh, inspired from uh, design thinking. Uh, and uh, the problem is that uh, we are starting and doing our plan A to, plan A to start expo exploring, yeah, validating and learning about the problem space. I've seen too many teams that made their plan A, plan A and just do the next step, which was validating the only good idea for the solution that they had in mind from the beginning. If you do not spend if you do not spend significant uh, time with uh, your team understanding the problem, which you often have to reframe at the end of the process, um, you you won't you won't go go there because your assumptions about the, this great great uh, solution is is uh, in my opinion it can be it can be wrong. Yeah, when you jump in the solution space. Uh, then you have to start with the ideation phase, yeah? So this, this your great one solution is not there yet, yeah? If you are lucky, your wonderful idea or perfect solution will be one of them. But I, I assume it will change because you will learn a lot of things, you, you will discover a lot of, lo, lot of insights, so even your great solution from the beginning will, will change a lot. Okay, so the information is in the people, so not in your head, yeah? You all know Steve Blank's get out of the building phrase, I suppose, so I think this is more cr most crucial and the most underestimated, uh, underestimated ingredient of product discovery. Every time I follow uh, this advice and get out of the building, and I'm starting, for example, interviewing a well-defined group of people, some magic happens. I suddenly start to really and deeply understand uh, my users. And after just few interviews, interviews, I also start to see some problem patterns uh, in their stories. And this is, for me, truly the aha moment of product uh, discovery. Uh, of course, it is hard to run interviews correctly and then validate uh, which findings are common for the larger, larger number of people in a quantitative way, but it is still, for me, the most opening eye activity uh, and every product manager should be doing it often to fill the problem and to constantly look for better solutions. Uh, so let's see a few uh, validation process tips. First of all, one of the most common mistakes I've been, uh, I've seen and experienced by myself is to underestimate the importance of either qualitative or quantitative data. You need to use them both, really, because one is about what people are doing and the other is about why are they behaving this way. So I believe you need to both to find high value jobs to be done that can be solved in a better way by your team. If you feel confident, just with one sort of research, find someone who knows uh, more about the other one. This is another advantage of well-formed discovery team. So please uh, both use both of them because, because if you do it uh, like that, 
there's a, a great value. And sometimes you start with qualitative data, sometimes you start with quantitative data. Uh, um, it it uh, also it, everything is you know based on our context, let's say, uh, and our 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 initial questions we want to we want to uncover. Uh, so another thing is a focus. Yeah, when you are in the process of new product development, you should be focused on one or at most two things that you would like to explore and validate. I've seen many times when uh, teams were on the problem phase and they they plan to validate few crucial aspects in one test on one, in one experiment or research. Like they uh, they they mix everything, like validating market and demand with product or solution, and uh, willingness to pay. Yeah, so everything just we know what's the problem, so they just let's now validate everything. That's not the best option, because if you fail and you will probably fail, uh, you won't learn anything. Yeah, you won't know what didn't work, uh, and you didn't you you won't know why. So there will be no learning. And um, as you remember, fast learning and uh, acting on it it's our heart of our product discovery efforts. Okay, so uh, we've we've got um, a lot of uh, different types of validations, um, and. Uh, this is also really important is to that you don't so you 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 need to run more than just one uh, validation test to to find the answer or find the answer of those you know really important questions yeah uh, you have to behave like uh, the best detectives who are looking to collect multiple evidence that helps them make much more informed and you know data driven decisions and in their case accusations yeah remember when we talked about qualitative and quantitative research methods use both of them and collect as much data as you need remember that you have to balance uh, between speed and strong enough evidence and data to move forward yeah so so try a few of them try data analysis surveys competitive analysis for example so three of them in fact finding don't do just one don't do just one smoke test uh, try to uh, try to do few things like smoke tests like some fake ads or or result of us to to have more data uh, and then you can you can you can really uh, make some great decisions yeah uh, another tip is that you should really democratic democratize the your sharings yeah with everyone uh, your learnings with everyone so uh, with all your member uh, team members um this uh, can allow you to make you know you, you more use of your data uh, that everybody works hard to collect yeah the great tool to use that allows everybody to learn about uh, progress see the whole picture and even work on new conclu conclusions conclusions or hypothesis is uh, Airtable. we used Airtable a lot uh, and it helped us a lot because everyone saw what's going on and how is it working so especially those coming from qualitative research methods uh, we could you know easily uh, share it with everyone else after the the interviews for example and everyone else could you know add some learnings from from their sites on some, on some thoughts from from their sites so uh, of course you can use any tool you you feel comfortable comfortable with but it is just um, it should be just accessible and easy to use for for everyone Okay, the last thing I want to share with you is uh, your level of confidence, let's say, yeah? Your team and your stakeholders need to understand that the product discovery can grow uh, your chances of building a great product that will succeed on the market. But remember, product discovery is not a magic wand that will make your risk or uncertainty disappear. However, understanding uh, it, it, uh, how it, how it works. It lowers your stress levels and helps you choose the best methods of validation as you move forward. This is a great, uh, a great uh, example from Itamar uh, Gilad, uh, who who shows um, uh, how, uh, how uh, every of uh, um, every data uh, has, you know, confidence level. And you can you can see where is others' opinion or your estimations, and and where are the test results or your customer evidence that are made or high on high numbers like twenty plus users, for example. Yeah. So uh, think of think of product discovery as a, as a as a way to validate uh, things very quickly. 
remember not to be discouraged by, by 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 few fails because they will happen but it is this is okay and this is the part of the process uh, and uh, always remember about these few things yeah about viability feasibility and desirability yeah do uh, of course, we we are starting with the uh, question: Do customers want this problem? Yeah, but then we got the solution and uh, questions about the solutions. Can we build this? Can we can we make money on on it as, as well? When we talking about viability, I think Jana will uh, have a deep dive on this topic soon after my presentation. So, discovery master chefs. This is who we all are as a product managers. Yeah. So we've got those tools, we've got those knowledge, and now we have to focus uh, uh, and 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 really uh, just uh, you know create completely new dishes. Yeah. And I and encourage you to do to do the same because there is no one great product discovery process. You have to you have to pick uh, and and create your own one. Yeah. And if you feel unstuck. This is your. This is something you can you can use. This unstuck map and great navigation that will help you to build something that people will actually love. Yeah. So thanks a lot. Uh, if you want to dive deeper, uh, please join our product discovery community on Facebook. Uh, you can search it in uh, in Facebook by uh, typing product discovery community PL. This is in Polish language. Or you just you, you can just uh, contact me and drop me a line, and I will be here, uh, happy to help you. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Mike. Uh, well, you haven't, you probably weren't expecting me. This is Marcin. Uh, I'm um, stepping in for uh, Paulina because our uh, most important stakeholder um, basically takes no prisoners and uh, it's his bedtime right now. Uh, I don't see any. Uh, okay questions uh, off the bat. Um, if you want to have some questions for Mike, uh, feel free to write them in the comments and maybe we can recirculate them um, in a bit. Um, so thanks a lot, Mike. Uh, great insight for everyone. Uh, and if you have uh, more comments, perhaps. Uh, uh, I suppose, I, I, I think one, I think I, I see one question. All right. Uh, yeah, about four teams working on a product discovery. What team size and what skill set within the team uh, do you find the most efficient? Yeah, from Justyna. Yeah, so when you are setting up your product discovery team, you have to think about this as a cro cross functional team uh, and it should be a self sufficient team. So basically, the MVP is better. It's it's better to be two of you guys than just one, because then you 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 can get rid of your biases and 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 and, and your ego. Uh, so this is like the minimum. But it's it is it's really great if you got like a PM leader, so a product discovery manager or product product manager, uh, or some kind of um, customer experience manager, and then you've got an um, analyst or UX designer. Uh, you can also have researcher and it's good to have some kind of full stack developer or full stack growth marketer so four five people i would say uh, so this is some, something similar in dynam dynamics as a scrum team i suppose yeah so we have to be cross functional and self sufficient thanks so there was a similar question from adam what kind of people should be in the product develop discovery team i think you've covered yeah. that quite well um all right thanks a lot mike um Thank you. Thank you for uh, being with us tonight and i'll introduce our uh, next speaker now. So our next speaker is Jana Basto. Hi. She is uh, the founder. She's the founder of Minded Product. She's the founder of Product Tank. She was uh, one of the founders of uh, Product Camp in London, although Product Camp is a bigger brand, but uh, she was one of the organizers uh, of it in, uh, in London of the first events. And she's also the founder of uh, ProdPad, which is a, a, a software as a service tool for product managers and product teams uh, to deliver uh, better products. Uh, no, I don't think I can say anything about more about Jana that will give her more clout <laughs> to, uh, to play to you today. Um, so without further ado, Jana. Wonderful. Well, thank you for the warm welcome. And uh, thanks to uh, Greg and to Mike for the uh, uh, the, the starter, um, uh, the, the great talks on uh, product discovery. Uh, and um, I'm going to pick it up and uh, start talking about finding product market fit and why it's really hard to, to figure out what product market fit is and how to know when you've actually found it. 
um, and why it's a bit of an illusion, even if you do think you've got it. So, um, you know, Marston's already given me a great intro, uh, but here's how you can reach me, because I'm always happy to talk to product people and reach out to them. I'm super easy to find on LinkedIn. I know this isn't a real life event like we usually would do, uh, but come find me on LinkedIn and connect with me as if we've met. I'd love to find out who's here and, uh, and connect with you all. Uh, reach out to me on Twitter. My DMs are open. I'm at Simply Basto, or you can just email me. I'm Jana at ProtPad.com. Um, as Marcin said, I am the founder of ProtPad, which is software for product managers, and also one of the founders of Mind the Product, the huge global community and series of events for product managers. Uh, so great to be here. Great to um, be able to chat to the communities of, uh, of Warsaw and um, Hello Krakow as well. Really glad that you could join. Uh, I think it's a really unique situation that um, you know we're doing this digitally as opposed to um, in person, like product tanks usually are. Um, you know, it's a really surreal time, uh, but it has started opening things up. Like if we were doing this digitally, I I wouldn't be here because I'm in the UK right now. I'm in Brighton, UK, locked up in my living room. But it has opened up unique possibilities because I know that uh, you know we've got two cities joining the same one. Uh, not just those two cities. I want to do a little shout out because we also have my mom joining uh, from Canada. So everyone say hi, mom, in the comments, and uh, hopefully she'll see that and uh, join along. Um, also, a little bit surreal. This is my first time ever doing a talk from my living room. I'm kind of talking to no one here, but everyone at the same time, this is what I see. So I've actually got a little teddy cheering me on in the back there. That's my little stuffed jaguar. Hopefully he'll he'll laugh along to my jokes. Maybe not, but um, you know, sad that I can't see your smiling faces. But it is good to know that we've got a bunch of people signed in, listening along today. So thank you all for all your support and uh, making this all possible. Right. So, what do we mean by product market fit? It is a tricky term to to put your finger on. I mean, <laughs> let's go back to. Mark Andreessen's um, original uh, term when he came up with this, when he coined it, he said that product market fit means being in a, a good market with a product that can satisfy that market. And that seems simple enough. Uh, I pulled out a couple other quotes that, um, that, that I found resonated just enough to kind of share with you today. Uh, uh, Paul Graham from Y Combinator said, you know, you, you know you've got product market fit when you've made something people want. Right? And I kind of know that feeling. I've made something that people want. People are paying for it. So great. Check. Product market fit. I, I think many of us as product people have made something that people want, which is great. The other guy from Y Combinator said, uh, users spontaneously tell other people to use your product. Excellent. Another check. I've had that milestone passed before as well. So does that mean that I've got product market fit? Hard to say. I saw a talk recently and uh, this talk really annoyed me because the, the person on stage simply summed it up. And this is a, a company who definitely had product market fit. You definitely had uh, had heard of this brand on the, uh, uh, on the street. Many of us product people probably use this as part of our tech stack. I'm not gonna say who it was, but the founder you know, had definitely made it. But his description of it, at the end of the day, the only thing I could say that he called product market fit was, you can feel it. And I left my head, I left that talk kind of scratching my head, going, well, can you feel it? I mean, how do I know that I've got product market fit? Have I got product product market fit? When did I when did I get product market fit if that's the case? And you know, there is this case that. Some people say, you know, you know that you've got product market pit fit when people are banging down your door trying to give you money and you wake up one morning and it's, you know, investors are trying to give you money and customers are giving you money. And you know what? Take it from me. I'm a bootstrapper. I bootstrapped ProtPad. And I can tell you that this is not always the case. There was no magical day when I woke up and everyone just suddenly wanted to give us money. There was no magical day when I just felt we had product market fit, even though by all measures, we seem to have a viable, profitable business that runs. So, you know, it doesn't really seem to, to resonate as a, as, a, as, a, as a definition. I didn't wake up one morning and just feel it. 
And I think one of the reasons why it didn't really resonate with me is that it's not very measurable, right? None of these, none of these definitions are things that we can really measure. And if you're anything like me, a product person, you've got a bit of an inner nerd and you've got to satisfy that inner nerd, right? You need to know what it is that you need to measure and how you can improve on it and how you can iterate upon it to get to that, to that magic moment. So what can we actually measure? Well, this is one that I heard quite early on. Uh, and I was told that we would have product market fit when we, once we had 10 completely unrelated customers um, that weren't your mom or like friends paying for your paying for your product. At that point in time, that's when you had product market fit. And you know what? Yes, I remember those first 10 customers and it was a tough slog to get there. But you know what? That was when the product was barely ever done. That's when I was building it in, you know, back in the good old days when I was building from home, um, not intentionally just because we couldn't afford an office way back in the day. Um, and you know what? It was a long slog to get there. And I realized once we'd actually gotten there that this is a lie. Product market fit is not 10 customers. It's probably some, uh, Thing conjured up to encourage fresh-faced entrepreneurs to, to keep going, to set achievable goals. Uh, but in hindsight, getting those first 10 customers is actually a lot easier than what is to come beyond there. What I've actually discovered is that product market fit is actually way beyond 10 customers. At 10 customers, you can probably say that we reached problem solution fit, as in we found a problem and we found a, we built a solution that could possibly solve that problem. And people were paying for that, which is great. That's a good milestone. But product market fit itself is probably closer to the thousand customer mark. Uh, as in that's the indication that you've got an actual market for it, something sustainable there. But as you'll see, it's even not as clear cut as that. It's not some magic moment that happens when you cross that thousand customer mark either. So even then, I think product market fit is actually more of a window. It's a moving target. Everyone has a different definition and a different way of measuring it. Uh, so here's a bunch of ways that I've learned to, to think about product market fit and uh, that I hope you'll find useful. So product market fit doesn't stay still. What you thought would be product market fit when you first started off is, is likely nowhere near what's what's needed once you actually get nearer to that product market fit. You know, new market needs arise, new technologies come up over the years and they drive new desires and expectations. Uh, new competition enters the market every day and it sets new bars for you to, to, uh, to, to hit. Um, you know, even if you had product market fit, if you were sitting still, you'd eventually lose it. And who knows, you know, potentially a lot of people just lost product market fit or gained product market fit because of this coronavirus uh, crisis that's just hit because the market has just vastly changed on us. So product market fit itself changes because the market changes. And I think most of us here, we're product people. So we understand the product pretty well. I mean, that's the thing or the combination of things and services that we deliver to, to meet a need. But I want to pick apart the market side. This is the less understood side to us and throw out a few common misconceptions that we often have. The first one, you are not your market. Now, we got this one wrong at Prodpad. We built the first version for ourselves because we were product managers and we thought, well, how could we possibly go wrong with this? We are product managers. Uh, we are building tools to do our own job. So let's just build a tool that helps us do our own job. And that's what we did. And lo and behold, we got better at our jobs and it solved that problem. When we took that to market, it failed. It wasn't right for the wider market. We hadn't spent enough time talking to other product people. And turns out we did not know everything. We were not our market and it was harsh. We had to throw away months and months of work. So you are not your market, even if you are quite literally the persona of your market. And your early customers are also not your market. 
early customers are a unique creature, right? They're, they're, they're wonderful and they're happy to pay for your half-baked product, but they have different needs and completely different tolerances than regular users. They're not indicative of the type of people who, who are going to use your product in the long term. And likewise, beta testers and people who sign up from Product Hunt and other launch campaigns are not your market. The problem with testing with beta testers is that beta testers are really good at testing betas, but they're really not good at acting like real users with real frustrations and acting like the real type of users who are going to use your product down the line. They aren't an indication of the wider market and the wider fit that you're going to see. And so you might have some great launch, but it's not an indication of who's going to buy your product down the line. So don't be fooled by your early users, your early product hunt launch campaigns, your beta testers. They're not your market. So let's look at what we mean by fit, because this is the part that tends to trip people up the most. So what do we actually mean by fit? Now, just because someone pays for your product doesn't necessarily mean that they've got this natural fit, this automatic fit. Just because someone has paid for it doesn't mean that it's, it's something that they're going to continue paying for. An example might be um, if you're selling a, a B2B product, you're selling to companies, if you're charging less than, say, $100 a month, $100 a month to a company is nothing. I mean, the person buying it is not using their own credit card. They're using their boss's credit card. And so they're often happy to just trial something for a few months, even if it does mean spending a few month, a few hundred dollars to test something out. And what you'll actually find is that they'll, they'll use it for a few months, see how they get along with it, and then churn after a few months. It's a really common pattern to have, see this churn rate really, really skyrocket for the first few months and then level out. And what's actually happening there is that people are buying in order to try for an extended period because you only offered them 14 days or 30 days, which wasn't enough. They're paying some extra dollars to, to, to get three to six months worth and then churning at the end of that. Well, on your books, you're saying that they're customers and that they're a, a purchase fit. But in their minds, they're just still trialing. They haven't actually been a fit. They haven't actually onboarded. They're not actually indicating that they're they're uh, uh, that they're that they're getting actual value out of it. So an actual purchase does not necessarily mean a fit. Uh, and the other thing is that your users change. Uh, we realized this um, over time at Broadpad when we first launched. Let's say a month into um, building Broadpad when we first put it out there for customers. All of our customers had been with us for at most 30 days. They were all pretty novice users, all new users uh, with new needs and pretty basic needs to start with. Uh, but over the years, now that the, the, the product has been out there for years and years, some of those original customers are still with us and their needs have changed. They're much more advanced users. They've got much more advanced needs in the product. And yet today we still have hundreds of users who've only been using it for 30 days or so. These are our new cohorts. And there's this tension of trying to build something that's both advanced enough for your existing long-term advanced users and something that is simple enough and engaging enough to onboard brand new users who just want to see the simple side of it and get started with it. So your users' needs change. And if you don't change with them, you'll lose product market fit. Your, 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 your customers can grow out of your product if you don't adapt, but you can also lose the interest of new users if you over adapt and make your product too complicated. So how do you actually get to product market fit? Well, a few things you can be doing here. One is talking to people. And I mean, this is a pretty obvious one. We hear this all the time, get out of the, the building, uh, maybe not right now, stay home, um, but <laughs> uh, you know, break out of your box, right? Just find ways of talking to your users through surveys, through emails, through uh, video calls, through whatever means you have. There's a million ways of doing so these days, but don't just talk to your customers. Don't just talk to the people who opt in to, to chat to you. Uh, don't just talk to the ones who look like they already like your product because they're gonna reinforce what you already thought was good about your product. My favorite users to talk to, and sometimes the most painful ones to talk to, are the ones who don't like your product. Because these are the ones who 
uh, have the most to say that will actually tell you why your product doesn't fit so that you can actually start acting on it and improving your product. So start asking really tough questions. One of my favorite questions to ask is, what frustrates you most about our product? Because if you ask this question of somebody, anybody who's using a platform, if they love your product, they might take a step back and think of something niggly, something small that's been bugging them, because everyone has something that frustrates them. And they'll let you know. And it might be something simple that you can fix for them, and it just becomes this delighter. And if it's somebody who doesn't like your product, they will let loose. They'll give you a couple paragraphs, and they'll say, oh, it's not just one thing. Let me just tell you the five things that frustrate me the most about your product. And while it'll hurt to read, it'll also give you and your team so much stuff to go think about and ways that you can improve it for the next person who comes through so that they're not frustrated about the product when they come through and uh, take a look at it next time. And share your vision. Talk about your vision. Make sure that people who are using your product understand your mindset and where it is that you're actually going with the product. Uh, there's no point in building something without uh, really getting a sense of whether you are solving grander problems for your users, whether you're actually trying to solve something more compelling than what you've got on the plate right now. This will help you actually uh, set your product roadmap, your, your product strategy in place. Now, a lot of people think about the roadmap as this perfect plan, this list of features to go do, and that's not what it is. I actually like to think of your roadmap as being a prototype, but for your strategy. And once you actually depart from that idea of it being this perfect plan and more about this prototype, it gives you so much more freedom. Because what you're actually doing here is just using your roadmap to test as to whether you're actually pointing in the right direction and whether your strategy has the right things in there. So what I actually mean by this is that, uh, if you were building a new feature, you wouldn't go straight from an idea to a final spec without checking with anybody and you know send it straight off to development. You would start with a simple prototype, a piece of paper that you'd sketch something out on, and you'd show it to somebody on the team or a customer or somebody else, and they'd give you feedback on it, and they'd tell you that your prototype wasn't perfect, and you'd throw the prototype out, and you'd start again and get a slightly better version of it, and you'd throw it out again and again. And the thing is that the value isn't in the pieces of paper, the prototypes, it's in the conversations that you're having, because what you're doing is you're putting your assumptions down on paper, checking those assumptions with key stakeholders, either your team or your customers or all of the above, and you're getting closer and closer to the right answer, something that actually resonates with the market. The roadmap has the same opportunity, but what you're doing is you're writing down your assumptions of the big problems that sit on the horizon for your company. You're writing down the assumptions you have about the challenges and the, the problems that you need to solve. So you write those down and you check them with your team, with your customers, with whoever else will listen, whoever else has a say in your strategy, and you'll throw out that first version of the roadmap because you'll inevitably, inevitably be wrong um, and come up with new versions from there. And as you're doing so, you're going to be able to figure out what fit looks like for your market. You'll start to get a, an understanding as to what that path to product market fit actually be get, um, actually starts to look like for you, you and your company. I also recommend testing everything, not just your product. Now we can, we as product managers are really good at setting up tests within our product itself. We can A-B test interfaces like no one's business, but I find that product people tend to shy away from testing things like packages and pricing and propositions. Test these things as well, because that is how you actually test the market fit side of things. Sometimes your product is fine, it's just that you need to tweak who you're marketing it to, or how much you're marketing it for, or how you're, how you're marketing it in order to get that fit just right. So it's a two-way side of thing, two-sided thing that product market fit. So test everything, not just the code, not just the interface, but test the packaging, the pricing, the proposition, everything else around it. And be ready to move fast. This isn't just a focus on delivering features, but generally having an, a, an ethos of, of fast learning and discovery and fast reactions on those discoveries and opportunities, um, releasing faster than your competitors, being ready to adapt 
Um, you know, we all know, we've all seen that the world can change really quickly, and it's the companies who are adaptable who are going to be able to uh, refine their fit when fit changes the way that it just has. And be ready to ask really tough questions. Things like what uh, you know, things like um, what frustrates you most about the product is a tough one. Um, set your set your ego aside and just be ready to learn. One question I like to ask, and I get everybody on my team ready to ask as well about the product and about individual features as well. If this product didn't exist today, would we still build it? If we just had all of our people and all of our resources and for some reason the product was gone tomorrow, is this still the right product to build? If we came in tomorrow and this feature was missing, is it still the right feature to build? So this helps you take a step back and think about whether you're actually on the right path or whether you're doing something just because you've got this sort of sunk cost fallacy leading you down this path. Really take a step back and think about what it is you're building and why. So how do you know if you have product market fit? What does that look like? As I said, I want something more measurable. So one of my favorite tools for this is the customer development survey. Uh, Sean Ellis developed this in 2009. Uh, I wish it were more well known this, than this, so I want to share it with you today. Um, he's put it up on pmfsurvey.com, so you can get a, a great example of it there. Or just use Typeform, right? Just create a form out of Typeform or Google or anything like that. Uh, and I find this way more useful than NPS. Um, NPS, I think, has huge limitations, and I'm going to show you how um, uh, th these two compare and why this version is so much more powerful in helping you find product market fit and just generally product discovery. So, first question you want to ask. You're trying to establish what problems they were trying to solve when they, when they found your product. So ask this question, what initially attracted you to this product? Right, what brought them there? Ask that question, leave it as a, a blank open field and see what they put in there. Really good question, just to set that baseline. Uh, this one's really key. How would you feel if you could no longer use this product? And this should be a multiple choice question with the choices of very disappointed, somewhat disappointed or not disappointed. And this one's the tough one because you're going to find that a lot of people may not be all that disappointed or only just somewhat disappointed if you took away your product. It's really heartbreaking and this is why you got to check your ego at the door. Now, the measurement, according to this internet person, this isn't an exact science, but it is a way to measure, um, is that if 40% or more people answer that they are very disappointed that they could not have your product, then you have product market fit. Again, not an exact science, but certainly one way to measure and certainly one way to measure up against others in the industry. This is why I've said maybe. Uh, there is more to the story than that. Um, it depends on who you asked and how the survey was distributed, how many people answered, and lots of other factors. Um, but it is a tough number to beat. Getting 40% or more people to say that they'll be very disappointed, heartbroken if your product was no longer there, um, is really tough, so it is a good number to aim for. Ask for more information. Ask them why they chose that answer, right? Ask them to d dive in and provide more information because you'll often get people giving you paragraphs of information as to why they'd only be somewhat disappointed or not disappointed. It gets more interesting from here. Another one. What would you use as an alternative to this product if it weren't available. And one of the reasons why this is, is really interesting is that it's asking them to scope out the competition without directly asking about the competition. And oftentimes you'll find that the answer isn't that they'd go to competitor A or competitor B, it's that they'd go back to a pen and paper or a whiteboard or an Excel spreadsheet, which is invariably everyone's competition. Uh, and that should actually give you more insight than a lot of other things, right? Oftentimes your competitor is not some other big name or some behemoth out there. It is just the status quo, right? If they would just go back to not using you, then perhaps there isn't a big problem to be solved. I love asking this one because what it does, it starts giving you ways to talk about your product that you can use in your marketing 
terminology on your marketing website because you should be talking about the benefits that you're getting from your product. So what is the primary benefit you have received from our product? You shouldn't be talking about your product in terms of the benefits you project onto them. Find out how people talk about you and use that kind of terminology and that will help you test that uh, copy on your website and get people thinking about, um, uh, help get them helping you to sell their your product for you. So find out what it is that you're actually best at. And also ask, what type of person do you think would benefit the most from this product? You can learn a lot from that as well. People have perce uh, perceptions as to who it's for. And if you find that it's actually misaligned with who you think you've been selling to, that's insightful. That might actually help you understand more about the market or more about how you've been selling it so that you can adjust and learn from that. I love this one. Um, asking people how you described it. Um, if, if you've, uh, if you've um, shared it with somebody else. So find out if somebody has um, shared it with somebody else and then ask how they described it to somebody else. Um, this is again, terminology that you can use on your own website, share it with somebody else or share it on your own website. I've seen people literally send me forms, emails that they've sent to friends or colleagues saying, hey, this is ha literally how I described it when I shared this with somebody else. And then find out more about the customer, right? Find out what their role is, uh, because this allows you to then um, segment and learn more about them. And so a couple of key things that you can do with this, segmentation, right? You're not trying to fit every market. If you're trying to fit every market, you're going to fail. You're never going to hit that 40% mark. What you can do is you can figure out of the different roles, were there any of those that you did have 40% or more? Right? And did you have 40% uh, of product managers saying that they love your product, but not of CEOs, for example? What does that tell you and how can you iterate and improve on that? So when you're measuring product market fit, it makes sense to measure based on that market and not every measuring and learning and adapting. And these are things that we talk about constantly as product people, um, you know, as we, as we practice it daily in our jobs. Um, and some of us have mastered it and some of us are working on it. And the key is that in order to get to, and in order to stay in that window that is product market fit, you've got to be able to adapt to what you've learned about your market and uh, to what your, your customers are saying about your market, what the market is looking for in those solutions. So you need to adapt your products to appeal to the right, pro to the right visitors, to the right market, um, and adapt your products to, uh, to fit their growing needs. Um, especially in a changing world like this, you need to adapt to outpace your competitors, outpace the pace of change that we're getting as we sit here in you know times of crisis like this. It is the companies who are able to adapt, who have that build, measure, learn down faster than the others, who are going to be able to get and keep product market fit better than anybody else. So you may or may not ever have a day that you wake up and and have customers screaming at your door, trying to give you money and investors banging down your door, trying to invest in you. Uh, you know, I think the product market fit journey looks different to every company. Um, I certainly did not have that morning that I woke up and everything was glorious, uh, but we certainly did by every measure get to product market fit just over time. Uh, so don't feel like you have to have some magic moment, but do be ready to measure it, to iterate upon it, to constantly build and learn and adapt your way to get to that window that we call product market fit. A final note on this product market fit. I think the best way to describe it is that it's the time when you've got that scalable, repeatable business model. And while it can look and feel different for each company, it generally means when you've got that point of that scalable, repeatable business model. If you're not there yet, keep going. Don't try to scale too early. That is the type of thing that can ruin many companies. Measure, test risky assumptions, uh, iterate in small, lean experiments as much as you can, iterate your way along, and scale as you learn. 
And I think that's how you can find product market fit. And on that note, thank you very much. Again, my name is Jana Basto. Uh, I'm happy to hear from you. Find me on uh, LinkedIn, Twitter, email me. I'd love to hear from you. And um, thank you very much. So, hi, thank you very much. Oh, um, I can leave Mike already in. Uh, are there any questions to, to Jana? I don't see any. But probably we can start from the questions that, um, unfortunately, Greg had to leave. Um, so we will try to answer any questions that uh, were um, at the beginning of the of the talks. So let's take a look. Probably we can try to answer this one. Could you please talk about stakeholder engagement and managing possible conflicts while doing the product discovery? Who <laughs> wants to answer this one? Uh Talk about stakeholder management and what, sorry? Stakeholder engagement and managing possible conflicts uh, during the product discovery phase. Uh, very good question. Mike, do you want to start on that one? Or do you um, want me to speak to that one? You're muted. That's odd, hold on. No, we can't hear you. Uh, well, let me uh, uh, let me jump in while uh, Mike gets his um, mic going. Uh, <laughs> so, um, stakeholders are the hardest part of any product manager's job. Um, I think uh, every stakeholder needs to be managed in a unique way because people are unique. Um, in terms of managing possible conflicts, um, I think the role of the product manager is to um, over communicate and to um, uh, spend as much time proactively thinking about where people might run into conflicts or run into problems um, where needed, pulling people in together to have these conversations and uh, preempting any sort of issues um, where uh, things look like they might be breaking down um, using um, uh, uh, shuttle diplomacy is a, is a term that some people might be familiar with, which is the idea of uh, going to each individual um, stakeholder and figuring out what their particular issue might be, understanding what sort of pieces of leverage you might have, and using that to sort of trade off and get everybody on a, a happy plane. Um, so, um, and it's, it really depends on your stakeholders. It depends on the state of your company. It depends on, you know, what the issue is. The thing is, is that with product discovery, most people don't have a problem with it if they understand what it is that you're doing. But sometimes companies have a problem with it if they think that it's this, this weird waste of time. If you're just going out there doing this research thing and you're not actually doing work stuff. But if you're able to show the value and the reasoning behind why you're actually doing this, as in, you will literally be able to create better, more valuable products doing this. Show what it is that you're learning. Show your past work. Um, that will often get most stakeholders on board. Um, but of course, not a guarantee because some stakeholders are trickier than others. OK, hi. Can you hear me, guys? Yeah. Ex excellent, excellent. So yeah, from my perspective, this is all about trust. Yeah, building a trust, having this uh, really important no bullshit, uh, no bullshit um, um, chat at the beginning of the process, uh, when you are aligned with your stakeholders, your boss, you uh, you you make your goal, you you define your goal and you stick to it yeah so it's uh, uh, all about trust without trust you cannot build anything yeah so if you got your stakeholders engagement they are engaged and you they understand where are you what are you doing what are your goals right now and you've got uh, trust for each other that's all for me yeah all right and for me um my new product has some great collateral that i encourage you to use um there's some stickers and this is one of the stickers Build products people love. <laughs> it's Absolutely. a great statement. Absolutely. 
Uh, if you rotate it, this is what it looks like. All right. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is how you can, an alternative path to managing stakeholders. I recommend this one. It works. All right. Great advice. Okay. Thanks very much, speakers. <laughs> Thanks, um, I'm going to take up another one. Uh, so this one is um, about any other, any alternative to the link canvas. So if link canvas is not the template for business case, then please propose any template for business case. Well, I think it is uh, actually a great template for a business case, but this is not not the only one, yeah, because for the beginning, I would say we should start with the value proposition canvas more than Lean Canvas, for example, or uh, because uh, Value Proposition Canvas captures jobs to be done and, and is focused on, on, on people's needs, jobs, and pains and gains. Uh, we also need to, to uh, use, for example, some empathy map or, 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 or personal, personal template. So, yeah, absolutely. You, you have to have your own stack of, of um, canvases and templates to, 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 to make and to build a great business case. One one template template is not enough from from my perspective. Hmm. Uh, and you know, my take on it is that the lean canvas is just one take, and it asks some good questions. Um, I also find that um, sometimes it's easier to simplify it down to as few questions as possible if you are just trying to get some simple answers out of people. Um, in uh, Prodpad, we used to ask for, you know, title and description and business case. And we found that no one filled in business case because it's a terrifying concept to anybody who's not in, in product for, or in a business side, that side of things. Uh, so we actually simplified that to just two questions. What problem are you trying to solve? Which anybody can answer. And what would the value be if you did solve that problem? Again, anybody who's coming up with an idea should be able to have some sort of handle on you know, what would come out of it if they if they did solve it. And if you can't answer those two questions, then again, maybe you need to go back to the drawing board and rethink this. A, a, a canvas is just a more full way of thinking this through. It might be the next step that you take. Uh, but sometimes just asking a couple simple questions is a good way to start. Thank you. Uh, there is another one uh, that initially was um added during uh, Mike's talk. Uh, how do you validate uh, that your idea is worth proceeding further? All right, so uh, it depends where are you uh, in the process, yeah, basically. Because uh, if you are validating the problem uh, or validating the market products and, or willingness to pay, uh, it depends, yeah. Or, uh, when you decide if it's worth proceeding further, uh, you've got you've got a bunch of bunch of um, validation uh, techniques to use. Uh, I showed some of them on on presentation. On presentation, I hope we will share it uh, a little bit uh, after the after the uh, our meeting, uh, so you can jump into it and see what types of validations have you got. I also have those uh, great validation patterns cards. I can show it to you right now. Yeah. You've got mm -hmm. a lot of insights inside of it, like a 50 of different uh, um, validations uh, techniques you can use. Uh, and it depends on on your context or, and on your uh, actual focus and your questions you want to solve right now. So I would go this way. Yeah. Uh, one thing I'd add to that is that um, somebody said this and I thought it was really wise. It's not your job as a product manager to usually validate an idea more often than not, it's your job to invalidate ideas. You're going to have way more than you know what to do with. And it's not your job to think of all the reasons why you should go ahead. It's to think of all the reasons why you shouldn't spend your company's time and money on doing it. Keep in mind that a squad might cost you a million dollars a year. Um, therefore, you know, it's, it's, you've got to think of all the reasons why you shouldn't do it, because it means that you're not doing all these other different ideas that uh, might be more valid. Thank you. Yeah, and, and start with the riskiest assumption. Yeah, always with the riskiest one. Don't 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 tackle the 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 second or the third one. Just uh, focus on the on the riskiest one. Um, I think we have the uh, uh, one more question. 
So I'm just going to read this out loud to everyone. Uh, kindly contextualize product discovery vis-a-vis -vis agile product development. Uh, in the agile product development process, where and at what intervals should we groom product discovery assets? Okay, that's a tough one, I think. Yeah, uh, so Jasim, uh, I um, uh, I highly recommend you to, 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 to learn and to, to, uh, to learn a lot of about dual track development, I think, uh, to, to Google it and to, to see what's, what's about, uh, what is it about dual track development. Well, it means that in uh, parallel to your Scrum product development, uh, process you should uh, also go with a similar product discovery process so you've got your own team your own bro product discovery backlog sprints team roles and activities yeah and then this is your fuel let's say for your um, um, product development uh, let's say um, uh, backlog yeah so this is like doing in parallel discovery and product development uh, I suppose uh, Jasim meant this this kind of uh, this kind of process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, to add to that, uh, delivery should take up uh, the smallest piece of your um, of your process. Um, I think the problem comes is when people jump into delivery and it takes up a longer and longer and longer period of time and they're afraid to stop that delivery and spend time in discovery when instead you should be spending as much time in discovery to make sure that the time you spend in delivery is in fact the right stuff and as soon as possible get out of delivery as in take whatever it is that you've built and check that it's in fact the right stuff, even if it isn't finished, even if it isn't the final product. The whole point is, is to test what you've got to make sure you've you've got something there. Um, and whether you do that in a, a dual track mode, as in you've got one team who's doing discovery at the same time as delivery, or if you're just quickly switching between the two, depends on the context of your team and how many resources you have and all that sort of stuff. But it's to minimize that delivery and maximize how much time you're actually doing discovery. Yeah, absolutely, uh, uh, Jana, that, that's absolutely right. Uh, also, uh, you can check out uh, Teresa Torres and uh, her uh, presentations and talks about, about product discovery. She, she tackles this subject a lot of times, so it's a really valuable, valuable one. Yes, absolutely. Teresa Torres has some amazing stuff on uh, product discovery. Thank you very much. Um, I guess that uh, all of the presentation uh, presented today will be available. Um, at some point, <laughs> um, I just need to uh, get uh, final yes from all of the speakers. Plus, it will be on the channel, anyways. It will be on the channel. I'm just, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, I'm just thinking about the slides okay. itself. Uh, right. if, I, if anybody wants my slides, just hit me up an email there. Um, I think I already have these ones on SlideShare um, or a very similar version. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm happy to send them over to you guys and make sure you have them. Thanks, everyone. We were, I think, 130 strong at some point. So good result, good turnout. Wonderful. Um, <laughs> Thanks for being with us. Thanks to the world, wonderful speakers. Uh, remember, people, pace yourself. Uh, careful with your livers. We still have a, about a month of this to go. Um, <laughs> um, do come back to the Mind the Product channel, and there will be more and more uh, product tank events from all over the world. Yeah. So, Thanks thank a lot, guys. Take everyone. care. The rest of your evening. Bye. 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 Bye.